as we cover many an insane movie and numerous cult TV phenomena. Are you ready to get jacked up? Are you with us? Then listen on. to the show good pal actress stunt woman and just all american badass carrie mccormick is here how are you my friend hey what's up <laughs> i'm good, <laughs> good like that good. intro uh, yeah well what other intro would i possibly want to do <laughs> the last thing i want to bore people and tell them hey and by the way don't even bother listening to this episode <laughs> <laughs> i was interviewing this one scottish guy and halfway through the interview like, he just flat out was like, oh, I'm in trouble with the Irish mob, so please don't use my name. I'm like, well, then what's the <laughs> <laughs> interviewing you if I can't even, I mean, <laughs> if I was a criminal, I, it wouldn't take much for me to do some digging and determine your voice and all that, but whatever. I'm just, we're not talking about that idiot. We're talking about <laughs> an extraordinary like yourself. So, um, so you've been part of just so many just different productions in atlanta louisiana and dfw uh and you're still going strong uh since just the 2000s and to present uh what may you know, you told me about many of your just inspirations especially bruce lee and what have you uh were there any other inspirations that made you say i do actually want to play pretend and make that be a living on the side well actually um two people in my family and one being my older brother Jim he um, was in theater in high school and so I grew up watching him play you know various roles uh, one of which my favorite is Fagin from Oliver which is like one of my all-time favorite uh, musicals and my daughter um, who was briefly in theater during uh, her elementary school days and she just, you know, looked like she was having so much fun. I was like, I really want to do that. But school I went to, their drama department came later. Um, and I was already pretty heavy into athletics by then. So um, just wasn't something, you know, I got around to doing until way later than most people. But um, yeah, it was always kind of just in the back of my mind, like, you know, one of these days, maybe I'll, I'll go check that out. And my mom actually sent me an article for uh, extras like that they were hiring. Yeah, nice. like, you know, Cats Casting over in Arlington at UTA, they were filming an independent film. So it wasn't Still a going, film. I think, right? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, that was, that was back in like 2007, 2008, I want to say. Makes sense. So she, she sent me that. And so it's, it's funny because I... I message Katrina Cook, who uh, is yes. the casting director from Cats Casting, but I didn't know anything about the whole process or anything. So I'm like, is this legit? You know, are you, are you, because she's telling me to show up at some place off of, uh, I don't know, somewhere over in Arlington. And I'm like, I, I don't know about this. Yeah. This sound... <laughs> is this for real? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was all skeptical and everything, but I, I told my mom where I was going and, showed up and then I see you know all the the production people and everything swarming around so I was like okay I guess I guess this is what I'm looking for and uh, so that 
night really was my first time, you know, being on a set and kind of experiencing that whole thing. And it was hot. You know, it was like in the middle of summer. Um, no air conditioning, of course. We're in a frat house filming these scenes. And, uh, you know, just started talking to people that were on set in between shots and kind of getting the scoop on what and how and where, you know, do stuff in DFW and, and just, you know, went from there and just started kind of researching that, signing up on different websites and whatnot and uh, just, just started building it from there. And he, even back then I wasn't really serious about acting. It was just something I, I just wanted to do for fun um, at the time mm -hmm. and, and pretty much, treated it as such for like the first two or three years. And then after I was doing it for a while, I was like, okay, yeah, this, this is really fun. I want to do more of it. And um, so that's when I started, you know, looking into agencies and all that kind of stuff. So, and, you know, training, doing what you're supposed to do. Uh, that That's neat. And, out of all the actors you worked with, who just left just the biggest impression with you to where you're like, man, if I got any resources, if I even write or produce something, I, I want you on the same project. We've got to reunite. Wow, oh, that's tough. Um, you've done, you've worked with Vivica A. Fox, Dennis Quaid, and just plenty of other just beloved just character actors who just go in between here in, in Louisiana, Georgia, and Texas. You know who, who jumps out at me for some reason? Probably because he just put me through the ringer. And this wasn't, this wasn't an acting thing. This was actually a training thing, is Keith David. Yes. You, you were, like, at an acting class with him? Yeah. He's, Seminar. He's, you know, for what he is, he's very approachable and down to earth. And, and I'm so thankful for that and so thankful to be, uh, have been a part of that class. It was two and a half days, just intense training i don't think i've ever done i remember like you that. would bring him up so many times just like keith david everybody you gotta meet keith david and i don't mean in a convention way you were very specific you're like keith just talk to keith you'll learn yeah. something <laughs> he, he was amazing and he just i don't know how he fits so many different aspects of acting into such a short time frame you know with with i mean we had probably a good 20 25 people Go um, from Mr. Rogers to John Carpenter and then to just all different kinds of blockbusters and voiceovers. You know, like... Yeah, I mean, and, and that's it. He he kind of uh, exposed us to a little bit of everything about him that he does, you know, the, the voice training, how to warm up your voice properly, even for, you know, acting gigs, not just voiceover, how to really... Um, get into a scene and and change it up and get out of your comfort zone i mean there's a picture of me from that seminar it's hilarious because i look like a rated lunatic and you would never no, ever see that don't say that <laughs> As, aside from you know maybe some of the action stuff that i've done you're but just this, ecstatic and happy <laughs> well yeah if, I, if i'm that happy then you're in trouble because i <laughs> really kill kill people. <laughs> yeah and and that was you know had nothing to do with action it was just a a revamp of a a monologue that i had been working on and i've done it all kinds of ways but the way he had me do it i i had to apologize to him because i said look once it's out it's out the the rage you know that you're trying to stir up out of me the mood the tone yeah it doesn't go back in. So I'm just letting you know <laughs> if I, you know, just start throwing stuff or whatever, um, that's, that's just what's going to happen. And, and so that's, that's what it is. So when you see that picture, I mean, the veins are popping out of my neck, my eyes are huge and you can tell that I have just like reached some level of, of something. And I, I've never, I don't like to do that in real life because it's scary and I don't, try to do that or had not tried to do that in my acting work up to that point and so that just kind of blew a lot of things away for me after that and I was completely exhausted after that after that uh, uh two and a half days I just went home and, and slept because it was exhausting 
this is like the best thing ever. And, you know, like I said, I was so thankful for that experience. So yeah, he, he's somebody I, I think would actually respond even though he's super mad busy and, you know, extremely popular. Um, I mean, he knows you. He's, you're, you're not just a random guy. Hey, will you please do my, you know, non-budget piece of shit movie? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he he is an artist. And so he's he comes from a very non-judgmental place already. And so he, he would be open to any kind of, you know, independent project. I, I feel very strongly about that. So yeah, I, he's he's the first one that comes to mind. Not right, to say the means, other ones might not, you know. But well, he's, no, you, he's you just didn't one. say that. You're just saying he left the strongest impression because you wanted to study him and his style and everything, as opposed to I just had a really fun time talking to you, bro. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, very cool, and uh, just. In terms of acting styles, uh, what would you classify a lot of your training as? I've done a little bit of the the classical from, you know, um, gosh, my brain is going blank all of a sudden. Uh, Well, I have their books all over my shelf here. Probably the most modern one right now is uh, Margie Haber, who's my coach's coach. She's out of LA. Mm -hmm. But if you want to, you know, take it back to like checkoff methods or um, uh, any of those classical trainings, I've had, you know, some introductory levels of that and that's that's something that I've been thinking about I'd like to go back to and be more immersed in Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of a lot of people who have trained with those you know uh, type of coaches back in you know 70s 80s from New York and LA have come out and they're some of them you know reside here in Texas or they come through um teaching seminars and and scene study classes and stuff like that, or they, you know, come back from LA and move to Texas. And so they're um, sharing that knowledge that they experience with, with those acting greats. And so I would like to go back to being fully immersed and classically trained, like some of the great names now that we see that are Oscar winners now um, have been. Um, of course, you know, being a, a working actor, meaning day job having actor, like most people are, you're right. Um, being able to dedicate myself in that manner is, is difficult right now. And so I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to half step it. I want to be able to, to do it right. And, and totally you know be engaged in nothing but that and no work no you know minimal family obligations just focus focus on that type of training for a period of time until I felt like you know I really um got what I needed to get out of it totally and you know with your various encounters you've done some small movies big movies and just even just shorts and other stuff that you're still waiting to see come out um when did acting just become just work versus just a very fun escapade i don't think it it ever feels like work um unless you know there, there's only a few instances where I felt like it was it was really work, and it's it's those times when you're you know on set for a ridiculously long amount of time, and maybe there's a lot of physical demands from you, but also, um, you know, it it's the interaction and the relationships you have with people on set. But I would say most of the time, I don't feel like it's work. I do feel like it's fun, even when it's intense or, you know, the conditions are, are, are tough, you know, weather, um, 
in Texas, which is all over the place, right? Uh, or, you know, you're outside, you're dealing with, you know, elements, um, live animals, <laughs> insects, um, and even dealing with difficult people. I mean, I, I've, I find that the challenges of all of those things, just like anything else in life, you know, it's all about your, your perspective, your approach to it and how you deal with it. And so to me, like I said, it, it never really feels like work unless it's just something that at the end of the day, it's like, I'm just trying to get through to the end at this point. And, and fortunately I've, I've had very few instances of that. Most everything I've done, it's been very enjoyable and you know, even when we might be suffering in the blistering uh, hot sun, the people and the, the production crew, all the other actors, you know, the project itself and what we're trying to accomplish, you know, compensates for that stuff. So you just kind of let all of that go. Just vent, just blow it off. Yeah. Stay in the game, stay focused. Um, and more or less, um, did you ever were you ever tempted to just even try some other aspect of filmmaking or was it just acting or you know nothing else well, it's, it's funny you ask that so um because you've been so great as a stunt coordinator and even just as a typical martial artist and stunt yeah performer. so i i have to back it before i even started acting and, and give you just like, kind of like a brief spiel about that um <laughs> Growing up in high school, I was a poet, you know, it was like just my personal outlet for, you know, teen angst, your typical thing like that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I enjoyed writing in that fashion. I never thought about at that time writing anything else. Um, fast forward to, you know, me getting into acting like I described before and then taking that a step further and getting into the, the stunt side of it, that was not something I ever even thought about either when I first became an actor. And it wasn't until I did a project at the Art Institute of Dallas with a group oh, nice. of kids who were all about action. They didn't want to do anything else. Um, the, they went by the name Pool Water. I'll go ahead and, and give them a plug, although they're, they're kind of like no longer since they've all graduated and everything. But they're the ones that really started that in me. You know, I had the martial arts training, but I never married the two together, acting and, and martial arts and stunts. Never married the two together until I did that project. And what it was is they did a reenactment of a motorcycle company. It's an Indian company called Bajai. And they did a reenactment of the commercial where it's these two girls fighting over who gets to ride on the motorcycle. And so they're duking it out like all over the apartment, you know, throwing stuff. And I mean, it was just crazy. And we recreated that with, you know, zero budget, zero um, special effects, you know, and there's no rigs or anything that we're using. They're students, right? So it's, uh, it's they're just using what they got and they're, they're we there. literally had an apartment and a camera and eight hours of choreographing the whole thing it, it the only thing it, it only ended up being like a minute and a half but it took us eight hours because the other girl that was in it with me had zero fighting experience she was a model and so wow. we chore <laughs> we choreographed it on on the spot as we went um, using the space that we were in to kind of recreate what was going on in, in the video. And it, it came out, I mean, I was just so amazed at what they did with the footage. And I was completely bruised up by the end of that. <laughs> you know, no padding, no anything on concrete floors. Were and, the performers pretty athletic, but you still had to make sure, you know, that they weren't gonna you know accidentally hit each other and what have you i would say i would say i took the brunt of all the beating <laughs> oh damn Be because but i wanted it i wanted it because i was like this is the coolest thing ever and so as we're doing the fight scenes um 
the other girl, she's just, I, I just told her, I said, hit me, kick me, whatever we're doing in the scene, just go for it. And, and she did. And so, like I said, as a result, I mean, I'm throwing myself around, uh, trying to, you know, sell what we're doing too. And so by the end of it, I had a huge bruise. All, my, the whole right side of my thigh was just one big purple bruise and my hair was in a knot <laughs> and, uh, I don't, I don't know what else was going on, but I, I couldn't have been happier with just the whole experience despite all of that. And I did four more projects good fight? with them. Oh, it's outstanding. It's still on YouTube. You know, you can look it up. I think if you, if you search on Bajai, B-A-G-A-I motorcycles, it'll come up. And like I said, as a result, I did four more projects with those guys, including 48 hour film festival, which was oh, sweet. Ridiculously exhausting, you know. It had 20, to be. It was 48 hours. 24 hours, hours is, <laughs> well, 24 hours straight, pretty much of stunt stuff. That's mm -hmm. a lot. Overnight and no, no break. So yeah, it was exhausting, but it was a lot of fun too. So I thank those I guys so. for kind of, kind of sparking that in me and letting me know, hey, I have a skill I can use in my acting. So that's that's where it came from. Those guys. Totally. Well, very stellar. Um, now, what are your favorite kinds of fights to unleash on film? Since I trained in Muay Thai as one of the uh, martial arts, I, I started doing martial arts right when MMA was becoming popular. And so mm, my teacher, off, all that. yeah, I mean, right when, you know, Hoist Gracie was doing his thing and all that. So uh, my teacher, my sensei at the time, kind of saw that and marketed his uh, studio after that. And so he had training in what, what they call San Su, but he also had training in Muay Thai. And, you know, so he brought basically Muay Thai kickboxing, boxing, and jujitsu to the studio. And then we also had um, guest uh, instructors come in and teach things like Aikido. We even had Krav Maga. Um, Arnis, which is a, a weapons type of training, just different things like that. So we got got a whole bunch of stuff coming in, but typically on a, a weekly basis, we were training those four disciplines. And out of all of them, Muay Thai is definitely my favorite because it's it's not something you see all the time, especially back then. It wasn't you know well known like mainstream until UFC kind of took off. But it is a badass martial art. I mean, it's just it's just brutal, and stylistically, I, I think it looks really nice on camera. Um, so if I'm doing the if I'm an actual person doing the fighting, I like to incorporate aspects of Muay Thai into my fighting as much as I can. Um, Sweet. If I'm choreographing, what I found works well, at least. In, in my limited, you know, um, exposure to, to choreographing is a lot of the people that are doing fight scenes have no fight training. They have no stunt training. Mm -hmm. So what I try to find out is what is, what is your training in movement period? You know, are you a dancer? Did are you play basketball? Sensitive? Can football? you lift stuff with your hands? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any kind, you know, were you a gymnast any, any kind of movement training that they've had at all and usually they they've had something so like uh, for example one of the fights i choreographed was for uh dennis o'neill's project bailout yep web series and he had these three girls that were like the the detectives lead characters and one of the girls is a professional ballerina oh wow so, you okay. know no no fight training, no stunt training, but she's a professional ballerina. I said, okay, we're going to use that because I think that would be really cool and unique. Mm -hmm. So in one of the fights, I actually have her. She can do like the, the high split leg kick. <laughs> so I have her do that like ballet, but in a mean way. <laughs> and it, it just looks so cool on camera because you weren't expecting that at all, you know, to, to – to come from her i mean she's a very pretty girl anyway but she's not dainty she wasn't a dainty girl she she was like an athletic ballerina so she 
she pulled that off by doing that you know high kick high split kick like a ballerina would do on stage but you know kicking somebody's head off it just it just looks so so awesome so that's that's what I try to do is and I think it makes people feel more comfortable too because they don't feel like I'm, I'm trying to you know force something on them that they're not used to doing I'm using some kind of movement that they are already familiar with in their body to do these fights and it, and it have and your it body be the work. weapon and here's how it looks on camera versus here's what you got to apply to it to your acting style and what have it yeah absolutely uh without naming names and not here to be heated but just in general just as a simple just uh talking point uh were there any who, who just weren't taking it all that seriously and you kind of had to just take them to the side and just say, Hey, no, my, my job is to keep you safe, but you got to actually listen to what I'm telling you, my friend, you're going to get hurt if you don't do this. You know? Yeah. There, there was one ego will not shield you from a punch. <laughs> there was one instance and this was me totally being the choreographer. I wasn't acting in any, any part of this project. And we had, uh, had a meeting and, you know, worked out the choreography or tentatively had worked it out because we weren't hundred percent sure what the location was going to be. I just knew it was going to be in a bathroom, like a public bathroom. Oh, so I'm wow. thinking I have a decent amount of space, right? Well, we ended up being in a really tiny, like one, maybe two stall bathroom. So I had to condense the choreography for that. No problem. You know, I, I'm pretty good about pivoting around uh, space limitations, but the two actors, again, very limited. They definitely didn't have fight training or stunt training, and even their movement training was somewhat limited. Um, but mm -hmm. one of them did have a, a bit of an ego. Um, I saw that when he came in for his audition with his shades on. The minute he walked in the door. <laughs> brooding and, and perhaps, you know, he's method. That's, that's all fine and dandy. But before I got on set, when we actually did the shoot, he ended up stabbing the other actor. And, <sighs> and first of all, I, I chastised the, the director and, and the crew. I was like, Bert, you should not have been shooting without me here, number one. So I could, you know, monitor what was happening. Mm -hmm. I said, Everyone you shouldn't have been. Bad. Well, yeah, I said, you shouldn't have been shooting with a live weapon either um, with somebody who has no training or experience with such things. I mean, we, we, we learned that lesson just here recently, right? The hard yeah. way. But, uh, I mean, unfortunately, but I mean, even just a simple walking through the scene, you know, and saying, here's where you are. And well, this person was overzealous already, and so having a live weapon in his hand was not smart. And so that that all that took place before I even got on set. And so after I, you know, chewed them out for all of that, then we we managed to get you know the scene done properly and safely. So that was really the only time where somebody was just kind of. And, it, and I don't even feel like it was necessarily ego. I think he was just so gung-ho about doing it that he he just let all the the, the safety part of it kind of go over his head. <laughs> and, and it's like, I just want to do this scene, you know, and it's not that big of a deal, but it is a big deal. It is a big deal for a reason. Absolutely. <sighs> Having to remind people is very annoying sometimes mm -hmm. uh, uh, so also um, are there any other martial arts styles that you were studying and you kind of wanted to train with or incorporate a fragment of that whether it was the Kinzei fighting method Krav Maga or any other thing <laughs> yeah Krav Maga I, I only got a little bit of taste of that at the studio because um, it's been a little my... popularized because it shows like and movies like Taken and 24, and it's like, but it's been around for quite a, quite a while. Sure, sure. But I mean, it, it's another one that's pretty brutal. And mm -hmm. um, I would definitely like to incorporate more of that style in, in my own training, but also, you know, in choreographing for other people. Because it's just, 
it's just nasty. I, I like the martial arts that <laughs> just you you just kind of cringe when you see something happen. And you're like, oh damn, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I, I like that effect. So, um, yeah, that's definitely one I would I would like to to incorporate more. Absolutely. Uh, also, uh, just any other just legends of the action adventure genre that you just still think go down as the best and are still probably the most inspirational? Um, I mean, you know, I'm old school. I, I, of course, like all the, you know, Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris, Van Damme, Stallone type people. Um, really, you know, lately, I mean, I, I struggle to come up with like to see who the up and comings are um, in in that genre. I, I think, you know, we still have our, our Jason Stathams and, and uh, you know, uh, Scott other Atkins, Michael J. Yeah, White. <laughs> all these other, well, and, and Michael J. White has kind of been, I don't know where he's been lately, but, um, yeah, I it, it's like they're all there, but there's there doesn't seem to be just like uh, any any particular actors that I can think of right now that one. are just yeah. coming out and and just making films like they did probably back in the nineties, two thousands, where they oh, were so true. Boom, boom, boom. Like Tom Cruise is everywhere, and yet Liam Neeson and Denzel kind of take a break every six months. <laughs> you know? Well, those guys are they're getting up there in age, so I imagine you know they're not really wanting to take on that kind of stuff much anymore. Mm -hmm. Now the ladies, you know, Who had badass kinda, films, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they had kind of started picking up more uh, of you know women getting into the action stuff, like you know Charlize Fine Theron one. and and <laughs> Mad Max and stuff like that. But it, it's still, and, and I can't say I, I have a problem with this. It it seems like Hollywood, at least right now, maybe more in the indie circuit, they're they're doing a lot more of that. And unfortunately, I I just don't get to see a lot of those films. But in the mainstream Hollywood, you know, big budget stuff, whatever, it does seem like they're returning to or trying to return to focus more on the acting and not so much on the stunts and stuff. The, the actors might do stunts or they may have stunt doubles, but the, the storyline and the, the, the genre itself, I don't think is the main thing that we see coming out of Hollywood right now. It's really more- That's so true. Oh, it's here and there, like even Charlie Theron's uh, The Old Guard, you know, that's happening here and there. But yeah. Uh, if you were to even just think of a female action star, it's kind of, it's been sparse. Like <laughs> the, probably the only person I can think of is Mariska Hargitay. She's pistol whipping just about every serial killer on SVU, but everybody well, else, yeah. yeah, is not really a Cynthia Rothrock or Michelle Yeoh type, but it is cool to see Michelle Yeoh is coming back slightly here and there. Yeah. I, like I said, I think, and there, there's so many, you know, avenues for, uh, filmmaking now too that it, it's kind of hard to aggregate you know the actors that that do this well or do that well there, there's so many people in so many uh, avenues you know with all the streaming and everything it's, it's hard to see who who is doing those types of things um, totally. and more or less um You've been on a bunch of web series. Do you think those are still going to prosper on, especially since it's just easier for people to, you know, just like everything is digital now, it's just easier for people to just put their movie on Amazon Prime, you know, as opposed to try to negotiate a Netflix deal. Do you think that's the same thing with YouTube? People are just going to keep doing their own talk shows and fictional series that wrap up in five, 10 minute episodes. Yeah, I, I don't see why that would change because, right. you know, it get, it gives pretty much anybody the ability to kind of get their work out there. Whether, Instant you know, credit and pay. Yeah, yeah you, you were talking about me me having aspirations to write. Um, I didn't quite finish that, that thought, but Apologies. I do. I <laughs> well, and, and that's me because I went off on a tangent. But uh, <laughs> There are no tangents, Gary. You're probably supposed to <laughs> 
there's a lot to say, right? Um, there's too much to say. There's it's a hard entertainment is a hard beast to nail down because how do you even begin? <laughs> so. Yeah, one thing about acting is I kind of get to focus on just that aspect of it, and, and I like that. But at the same time, you know, I have um, jotted down screenplay ideas. I have actually written some outlines of them as well i even wrote like some scenes so you would be um, the gal who would pitch stuff if anything or maybe act it out (laughs) in front of investors perhaps (laughs) yeah i mean i i could see myself really doing a lot of different things on the production side from writing directing producing but again those kinds of things to me are very difficult to do unless you're completely immersed in them because it, the the level of responsibility I think it has is is so much greater as an actor you know yeah I have I have to do my preparation and everything but I can kind of walk in and out of it whereas you know if I'm directing <laughs> it, it's it's a little bit more commitment than that so um I've got to be in a place where I can I can do that and again I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna half step it I'm not gonna you know pretend to do that, I, I've got to be able to fully commit to it before I'm, I'm going to step into that that world. So, I mean, it, it's definitely in my mind, and I, I feel like at some point I will get to that point. I mean, I already know what my first story is going to be about, and it, it's going to be about my life growing up because I think there's some even even in the world of you know shows like Blackish and Mixedish and and things that try to highlight well, a lot you of should have things. totally guest start on there you would have totally been eligible and been great on that <laughs> i just I, I think i have a, a an interesting and representative experience in real life that i would like to share and kind of poke fun at to some degree but also you know make people aware because i even today there's still a lot of people who just aren't aware of the kind of things that somebody like me might have to deal with and so it's just it's totally. just kind of bringing those things to light and like i said poking a little fun at it but also you know there's a message there like hey you know this is something you might want to consider when you're talking to people uh from from these groups maybe totally i had a cousin and i think it was as far back as like oh two oh three and she had a black boyfriend and she was given an ugly eye just walking into a restaurant bar one day and it was just like, it, you were still just seeing some just, and I mean, post BLM started to be a little political, but it's just like, we're still seeing a bunch of these attitudes that don't seem to be evaporating. Like no one seems to want to open up a conversation. No one seems to want to tell everyone, Hey, by the way, you guys are being dicks. You, you can't keep thinking just hateful thoughts and just act like it's all good. Absolutely. And so, you know, if, if art is supposed to limitate, uh, imitate life and vice versa, then that, that's where I'm coming from. If I'm going to write something, not to say I haven't had some pretty, I'm, you know, I like science fiction and, and supernatural stuff too a lot. So Ooh. a lot of my inspiration comes from that. But I would say, like I said, if, if I'm going to start with a project that I'm writing, more than likely it's going to come from my real life, you know, background experience. Oh, that's how it just becomes more authentic. Yeah. I mean, definitely right from people, you know, or have heard about or seen certain studies on, you know, as, as plausible as you can make the premise. Uh, so now we know everyone, Carrie needs to hunt down Kenya Barris's agency and ask him for a moment <laughs> of his time. For real. That, I, I'm sure he would actually listen. He's done so many other independent projects for Netflix. So, I mean, why not? Uh, furthermore, what are you watching right now that you find just very inspirational and you recommend other people check out? You would ask me that. And (laughs) again, (laughs) it's, it's one of those things and you hear acting actor people, you know, say stuff like this all the time. It's like, I don't have time to watch TV. Um, and I, unfortunately I really don't because I'm just doing stuff all day long 
up until I close my eyes and it's go to because bed. they all suck and they don't star you no I'm just kidding but I know it, it really isn't it really isn't when I when I, I watch onto a show you know I will definitely watch it and and keep watching it now uh I, I take that back I am watching Dexter New Blood right now I've oh. been a big fan of Dexter so I did um Carrie likes I did start watching <laughs> Yeah, there's just something about that show. I'm just um, kidding. I I get it. It's it's a fun <laughs> anti-hero psycho uh psychological uh crime thriller. So yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I usually have to lock myself on in on one show at a time because it, it's really all I can kind of squeeze in. And and I'm very selfish with my television time. So again, if I can't dedicate you know, a good hour or maybe a couple hours if I if I can binge it a little bit. But watching my show uninterrupted, I just won't even watch it. So that's that's another thing about me. I I want to focus on whatever it is I'm doing and not multitask things to death because then I'm I'm not really getting anything out of it. I'm not able to enjoy it. So I hear um, that. I don't watch so, anything. I'm and I, I watch pretty much everything from ten to four in the morning. That's just when I have time to watch shit. I don't have time during the rest of the day when I am doing editing or just working nonstop at work. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, that is that is the show I'm watching right now. The best part is when you set aside this time, you, you don't have to, you know, be interrupted or, you know, turn it off because other people are watching it with you and not finding it amusing or entertaining so it's like yeah i don't have any killjoys in the room <laughs> exactly that is like the worst too <laughs> oh anytime i've introduced a comedy to someone i just know it's just dead on arrival it's just because i'm just getting that sense of everyone just wants to desperately take out their phone and just not pay any attention to it i'm like god <laughs> damn it you killjoys killjoys maniacs you blew it up um so uh, furthermore, just any projects or other side hustles you want to promote, organizations or uh, activism by that stretch. So I would always plug uh, women in film. Yeah. Um, you know, it's joining that, deal. and it's yeah. it's not just for women, obviously, <laughs> but um, you know, it's a great organization uh, to help promote the. Um, projects that women are writing, producing, starring in, et cetera. And so I always want to plug that. Um, as far as anything that I'm working on, uh, got a couple of projects coming up. Uh, one's a short film written by Patrick Martin. I don't know if you, do you know Patrick? Years ago. Yeah. And it's, it's a little different. It, it does, at least uh, incorporate some aspects of stunt fighting and stuff in it for me. Um, but the way it starts out is a little bit different than probably anything I've ever done. And then I'm also working with uh, Skylar Thomas, who I've worked with a couple of times on a couple of short projects uh, where I'm playing a detective. Big surprise. I do that a lot. And uh, didn't really go to that other recent serial thriller, killer thriller, uh, Janice still in production oh yeah yeah uh, thanks for bringing that up actually um because trend is going to be expanding that he's he's actually trying to make it a, a trilogy I a think. franchise yeah uh, and so um so we've been kind of talking about you know kind of what the next piece of that's going to look like and he's great to work with he he's another one from way back when i first started acting uh, he was at UTA, and I did a project for him, and it was hilarious because uh, they were pretending they were kidnapping me, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it was kind of a, a learning experience for all of us, right? I had never been in, in anything. Your hair was way longer then. It was awesome. <laughs> I remember he showed it to me when I was working on yeah. the set, and I was like, yeah, and you, you start in, like, the biggest, like, uh, mind-blowing sequence in the whole thing so it's like that's awesome you get to be in a scene which everyone actually remembers in that short yeah it, that was the first kind of physical thing I did before the stunt stuff and I told the guys I said okay I want you to really grab me like you're you're trying to kidnap me you know I said I can take it if if you're getting too rough with me I'll let you know I said but I want you to you know come in grab me and drag me out of here you know and so that's that's what happened and it I thought you know 
came out great. And they were like, are you sure you're okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You know, I grew up with three brothers. I'm, I'm used to <laughs> yeah, a little bit of uh, scuffle. So it's all, it's all good. And I think that actually um, really gets me, you know, into a role, not saying that I have to always be fighting somebody. I don't, but um, that, that is definitely something that when I see it, in a role, uh, just motivates me that much more. And then, then of course, working with DJ Lewis, um, he's got a couple of projects. One that we had started shooting last year was a web series called Black Cobra. Uh, anybody who knows BJ, he loves uh, superheroes, comics, that sort of thing. So he's kind of fun because he's one of the few people locally that, that really does that kind of stuff. I mean, he's all about it. So any project that you do with him is probably going to have some aspect of that in it. And then uh, one of the other projects is a feature film that's more along the lines of like the femme Nikita kind of thing. Ooh. So, um, okay. Interesting. I don't know, you know, when we're going to start doing anything with that, but that that's a little bit of a stretch for me as a, as a, you know, action actor, um, because it's got, got some other aspects of the character that, you know, I haven't, uh, done before, like speaking another language that I'm not familiar with, things like that. So that should be pretty interesting. And then, um, some projects that should be coming out and or are out. Uh, worked with Eli Bams on his web series called Surviving the Cartels. Ooh. Um, it is on 1265plus.com. And I is play... Is that a newer streaming site? Or has it been around a while? That, that is his streaming site. So something, something I was going to mention when we were talking about streaming Please send is, me the link when we're done with this. I'll definitely... Yeah. Yeah, not only are people, you know, able to have all these avenues for getting their work out, but they're also, you know, building their own platforms. And this is an example of that. 1265 Plus is his um, his own platform that he's building, similar to, you know, Chosen.tv, which, you know, a lot of, to pretty much everybody here locally worked on Chosen at some point. But they, you know, they crowdsourced and crowdfunded their project built their own, you know, TV platform for it. And so, you know, it's international. And I, I think that is definitely probably going to become more and more because then, then you kind of own the whole project from end to end, even the distribution of it, you own all of it. So I think that's amazing um, that, you know, we have people here locally doing that already. Um, and uh, in that I play, a um, woman named Heaven Olson who has lost her only child to drugs and my kind of deadbeat ex-husband detective played by Dennis O'Neill surprisingly enough which I I really enjoyed Dennis and I go way back as well um you know we're kind of trying to trying to deal with that whole situation and there there's multiple storylines going on in that show so that's just one of them uh, finished shooting Trap Soldiers, which was directed by Arthur Muhammad and executive produced by C.J. Hudson, written by Entice and Untamed uh, here locally. Again, playing Police Captain Rachel Turner. Um, really great cast, strong female characters in that one. Uh, and a lot of twists and turns. You really got to be paying attention to who's who and what's what in that in that film because uh, a lot of little unexpected things going on in that one. That should be out sometime later this year. Uh, did a project called um, Autumn Road at the end of last year, directed and written and starring Riley Cusick. And that's a psychological thriller. It's very, uh, gosh, I, I don't know what I would compare it to other than, you know, it's got a little bit of the Dexter in it. Um, but, you know, just a very, not a horror film, just a dark, 
psychological film. And in, in that one, I play a lady who owns a diner named Lou. I'm kind of like motherly, but take no shit kind of a character. Mm-hmm. And I got to shoot a shotgun in, in that film, which was awesome. Not the first time I've handled guns in a film, but the first time I've actually shot one. So um, look for that. That's on Apple TV right now. And then what, what, what's it called? Autumn Road. Autumn Road. Autumn Road. Okay. Mm-hmm. Is that on your IMDb? I didn't see. Uh, it should be. Yeah, it should be on there. Okay. And then the last one is Peter the Series. And this has actually uh, been out for a while. Season one, I think, came out, I want to say, maybe three, three years ago, maybe four. Um, and pandemic kind of, you know, put a halt on them uh, finishing seasons two and three. But I think they are finished. And I believe season two is either out or it's on its way uh, to YouTube. So you can look for that, Peter, the series. Um, I am in the second season. Totally didn't get my uh, character name from that, but I play a, a mom who's, again, taking no shit. <laughs> Perfect. Very, very cool. And... Just any other just final closing thoughts for those just trying to attempt acting even during this difficult time? Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it is definitely not slowed down. Um, surprisingly, the pandemic maybe put a, put a halt to stuff, you know, when it was first kind of rolling out. But right now, it is definitely happening. And if you're wanting to get into acting, I would say train. Find a good, you know, uh, coach that, that you get along with who is legit and there's plenty of them here locally or you can find them kind of like I said rolling through town when they're doing their seminars and stuff like that but definitely get into some training start you know uh, looking on the free sites you don't have to pay for anything not one thing to find acting jobs in in this town or any town and, you know, network, which is a little bit more challenging now because a lot of the networking avenues that we had have gone silent uh, during the pandemic, unfortunately. But, you know, if you can get out to film festivals or, you know, like I said, women in film, they, they still, you know, have a lot of their activities going on. Anything like that where you can get to know other actors and other people in the business, do that. Um, Austin is still big on doing a lot of networking events. Um, so, you know, train, get out there and, and submit yourself for, you know, student films, get that experience on set, you know, network with the people there and learn all the aspects of production that you can, not just acting, learn, you know, learn a little bit about everything, lighting, you know, sound, all of it. Um, and just have fun. Be careful. We'll return after these messages. Hey, feeling down? Feeling low? Not enough podcasts about movies in your life? Why not try... They must be destroyed on sight! The new Podcast Cure-All, sure to get you right with the world and on a path to better living. We have exploitation, we have Italian horror, we have zombies, we have slashers, we have crime films, we have spaghetti westerns, we even have sci-fi and sex comedies. So take a dose of... They must be destroyed on sight! As needed, and let the hosts, Lee Russell, Daniel Harper, Paul Romali, and the odd guest host, Cure What Ails Ya. Warning, may cause atrophy, African consumption, black fever, bone shave, chin puff, colic, cramp colic, dropsy of the brain, elephantitis, grocer's itch, jaundice, mania, miasma, mortification, palsy, pox disease, rheumatism, scurvy, St. Anthony's fire, summer complaint, and worm fit in some people. Consult a physician before listening. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Ah, oh, necrophilia. 
Pretty young. Uh, uh, uh. It's a dead issue, man. Don't don't push it. Cinema Psyops is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked, prudes. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore. I am, in the most sincerest of senses, disappointed in you. It takes a powerful goddess like Connie, jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it. I'm still tripping out over that. Even as a kid, I was like, I gotta find a girl like that. Every week, I, I get a new look of disappointment that I never thought I could get it's out of. It's unimaginable. At 12 years old, you should not be watching this movie. Obviously. At 13, you should not be. 14, you shouldn't be. I'm not entirely sure even 17-year-olds should be watching this movie. Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this like little nerd glee with everything that kept Little history up. all yeah, popping up absolutely. at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you, you know, couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped from watching this shit at 12 years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was How did you watch movie. this shit at 12? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Psyops. Hey everybody, I'm Corey. And I'm Zach. And we're the hosts of Podcasting After Dark, a cast dedicated to late-night horror and sci-fi of the 80s and 90s, often found on HBO and Cinemax. You know, the movies your parents didn't want you watching as a kid. You can find us every other week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. This is what you want. This is what you get. It's time, let's check our cue, baby. Pair it with a couple brews, baby. We love your movies. We love the bad ones, too. So we watch them all and pass their lessons on to you. Oh, yeah. Everything I learned from movies helps to make life a little bit groovy. With a one last plot, holes are gratuitous movies. It's time to get busy with your friend Steven Izzy. At eilfm.podbean.com. Welcome to Who Was She podcast. I am your host, Tara Jabari. After a decade working in documentaries, marketing, and all things digital media, I found that podcasting is a strong medium to share stories. After years of producing for others, I decided to start my own biographical podcast. Who Was She will focus on the life of a woman throughout Baha'i history. The first season is about Lydia Zeminoff. Lydia's story explores the subjects of the power of language and faith. Her father invented the universal language Esperanto, and she came from a Jewish family and became a Baha'i. She grew up during World War I and was killed during World War II in a concentration camp, despite heroic efforts to save her life. How can one person's life intersect with so many others, connect across borders, and inspire a biography which inspired this podcast? Over the next few weeks, I will share her story with you and the lives that were most affected by her and those who affected her life as well. They include her father, Ludwig Semenov, her spiritual mother, American journalist Martha Root, and the Baha'i German soldier Fritz Mako, who worked for the resistance undercover while having to serve the Nazi party. I want to thank the author Wendy Heller and George Ronald Publishing for their blessing to let me use Heller's biography, Lydia, The Life of Lydia Zeminoff, Daughter of Esperanto, as a main and instrumental resource for this podcast. So please subscribe and learn about this amazing woman who traveled through three continents in an effort to bring unity through the power of language. You can also find more information on our Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest at Who Was She Podcast. Music was composed and performed by Sam Red. I am your host, Tara Jabari. Join us next time as we begin our journey about Lydia Zeminoff.
Are you sick of the same old stale podcasts? Well, then join Vanessa and Darren as they dissect movies of all kinds. The two lifelong cinema lovers bring their favorites, curiosities, and first time watches to the operating table and inject them with a healthy dose of snark. Then there's the waiting room where they examine books and short stories. So just look for them on Apple Podcasts and where fine podcasts are available. They're part of the Legion Podcast Network. Follow them on Twitter at VD Clinic Pod. Join them on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash VD Clinic Pod. Or email them at vdclinicpod at gmail.com. They're ready to cure what ails you. <laughs> and still, they just might be a little contagious. Hi there. It's Heather from the Watching Netflix Without You podcast. Did you know that there are over 1,200 Netflix original feature films and documentaries? And that number is only growing. So I've made it my mission to watch as many as I possibly can. Then, with a delightful guest or guests, disclaimer, more often than not my brother Ryan, we spend an episode rating, reviewing, and discussing a film at length. The first half of every episode is spoiler-free for those who haven't seen it yet. And in the second half, after a very clear spoiler warning, we dive into it. And that's really about it. You can listen to Watching Netflix Without You on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. We now continue with our program. on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up review show.